Hello everyone, welcome back to History 1151. In this video, we will discuss the American Revolutionary War in the South and the West, leading up to the conclusion of the conflict. As you know from our last video, the American Revolutionary War had reached a stalemate in the Northern colonies. The British held some of the major population centers but they could not successfully occupy the colony's patriot interior. The colonists had declared their independence in 1776, so simply outlasting the rebellious patriots by occupying the coast was no longer an option. To avoid this impasse and win the war, the British High Command resolved to open a new theater of operations in America, specifically in the southern colonies. This new campaign would concentrate on the South. Specifically, Britain's Southern strategy would focus on Georgia and South Carolina. The British landed their troops in Savannah in December of 1778. The British theorized that newer colonies, especially Georgia, would have a higher loyalist population, which would assist the British army in defeating the Patriots to the North. The British could also receive reinforcement from their military assets in East Florida, which they had gained from Spain in 1763 after the Seven Years' War, also called the French and Indian War. The British gained some support from the Loyalists in Georgia after their capture of Savannah, but the Loyalists were far more interested in staying home on their farms and plantations and making sure their slaves did not use the chaos of war as a chance to escape or rebel. We will talk more about the role that African Americans played in the Revolutionary War in a moment. The British Army's failure to gain major Loyalist support in Georgia led Britain to invade the Carolinas in May of 1780. The British captured Charleston, and the city, fearing a slave uprising, quickly submitted to British occupation as the Patriot forces retreated into the interior. The British army took a harder line against the Patriots in the Carolinas, forcing militiamen who had surrendered to actually join Loyalist units where they would have to fight against their former comrades. They also confiscated Patriot property, including slaves. Slaves of Patriot masters were allowed to join the British Army and receive freedom after their service. This policy originated in 1775 in Virginia, where the Loyalist governor, Lord Dunmore, proclaimed that enslaved people held by Patriot masters would receive freedom by joining the British war effort. It's important to note that slaves of Loyalist masters were not permitted to join the British ranks unless they were given permission by their masters. The Patriots also allowed black men to join their ranks, and many did, especially in Virginia and New England. It is estimated that between 5,000 and 800 black people joined the Patriots but over 20,000 joined the British, and about half, 10,000, served in the ranks of the military. In the South, the Continental Army and the Patriot militias fought both against British regulars as well as militias made up of Loyalist colonists. Both factions fought each other in pitched battles but the nature of the fighting in the Carolinas was much more chaotic, in some places devolving into violent civil war as small communities fought each other over their political alignment, but also over long-standing disagreements that predated the war. The partisan nature of the fighting made the war in the Carolinas very acrimonious. One side would attack another, and the other faction would respond with a reprisal attack. Both the Patriots and the Loyalists disregarded the delineation between enemy fighters and non-combatants as well. 
On one particularly bloody occasion, Benaster Tarleton, the British commander of a Loyalist cavalry regiment, saw his dragoons kill over 100 Patriot militiamen who were in the process of surrendering. Although Tarleton denied any wrongdoing for his failure to stop the killing of the would-be prisoners of war, he earned the nickname Bloody Ban, or Ban the Butcher, from the Patriots. On an unrelated note, Tarleton's family was heavily involved in the transatlantic slave trade, and Tarleton himself fought against the abolition of slavery in the British Empire as a member of Parliament in the early 1800s. As was often the case in the North, the Continental Army and the Patriot militias struggled to fight the British regulars in open battle. At the Battle of Camden in northern South Carolina on August 16, 1780, General Horatio Gates, the hero of Saratoga, was defeated by the British Army, Army under command of General Charles Cornwallis. Cornwallis, who was actually outnumbered two to one, having about 2,100 troops, defeated a 4,000 strong American force. Cornwallis routed the Americans, killing or wounding about 900 and capturing about 1,000 of them. The British sustained fewer than 300 casualties. Gates, the American commander, had taken a strategy that was too bold, and he did not play to the militia's strengths, who broke and ran under heavy fire from the smaller but more disciplined British line. Britain's victory at Camden opened up North Carolina for British invasion. Although Camden was a British triumph, the greatest victory that Britain saw in the South, their forces were unable to follow up on their success. North Carolina had a smaller Loyalist population than either South Carolina or Georgia, and Patriot strength increased the further northward the British marched. Additionally, Patriot militia attacked Cornwallis's Loyalist flank and routed the Tories, remember, that's another term for Loyalists, at the Battle of Kings Mountain on October 7, 1780. The enraged Patriots, spurred on by the battle cry, remember Tarleton's quarter, charged the Loyalists and defeated them. The Patriots then held a drumhead type trial, a type of hasty military court in which they sentenced nine Loyalist prisoners to death for their role or alleged role in the killing of the Patriots under Tarleton. Kings Mountain and its ferocity was emblematic of the American Revolutionary War in the South. Patriot militiamen fought their own countrymen with more ferocity than they did the British regulars, seeing the battle as an opportunity for revenge. It really was a civil war in the South and a foretelling of events to come, although participants in the Revolutionary War could not have realized this. Hoping to build on the victory at Kings Mountain, the American Southern commander, Nathaniel Greene, whom George Washington had put in charge of the South after Gates' defeat, adopted an aggressive strategy against Cornwallis. Greene divided his own force and organized a series of attacks to harass Cornwallis' troops. In one such attack, Daniel Morgan's Patriot militiamen sought revenge on Tarleton and his loyalists at the Battle of Cowpens on January 17, 1781. They were so successful that they effectively destroyed the British commander's loyalist brigade. Tarleton's militia played to its strengths, sniping at the loyalists from cover, and then killing or wounding over 300 of them, and then capturing 600 more. Without his loyalist cavalry, Cornwallis had lost his scouts, and the critical intelligence they provided, making his army much slower and more cautious. With the defeat of the Loyalists at Capens, Green attacked the main British force at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse on March 15th of 1781. 
As was the case at Camden, the Patriots outnumbered the British 4,500 to 2,100, over 2 to 1. The militia was not the reason that the Americans lost the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, though. Rather, General Cornwallis made excellent use of his cannons, firing grape shot, an artillery round that works like a giant shotgun shell to disperse the American attacks on his position. The battle was a tactical victory for the British, who drove the larger American force from the field, but it was ultimately a strategic defeat, as Cornwallis could not pursue the repeating, retreating patriots due to a lack of supplies and a lack of scouts, as discussed before. Consequently, Cornwallis made a retrograde, a military term for a retreat, back to the North Carolina coast, leaving the Patriots in control of all the Carolinas in Georgia, except for the coastal cities. Cornwallis instead planned an invasion of Virginia. Benedict Arnold, the American trader who was now fighting for the British, had already made a raid on Richmond, Virginia's capital, back in January. So Virginia seemed like the most logical place for another assault on the colonies. Before we talk about the British campaign in Virginia, where the major fighting of the American Revolutionary War ended, we should discuss how the conflict was fought on the western frontier. You all had a taste of how the frontier war worked in our discussion of the Saratoga campaign in our previous video, but now we will discuss fighting on the western borderlands in more detail. In the west, Britain's greatest ally was not loyalist colonists, as was the case east of the Appalachian Mountains. Rather, Native Americans were the most important allies the British could have, although not all tribes sided with the British. Some tribes sided with the Patriots, but most preferred to remain neutral, seeing the war between the British and the Americans as a family quarrel into which they should not become involved. Some Native American groups, like the Cherokee in the South, split into factions, with some siding with the British and others with the Patriots. In the North, the Six Nation Iroquois Confederacy was divided as well with the Cayuga, Mohawk, and Seneca backing the British, and the Oneida and Tuscarora siding with the Patriots. The Onondaga were mostly neutral. It's also worth noting that the Stockbridge Indians of Massachusetts sided with the Patriots, and did so from the beginning of the war in 1775. In western Pennsylvania and the Ohio River Valley, encompassing present-day Kentucky and West Virginia, as well as parts of Pennsylvania and Indiana and Illinois, the British and their local Indian allies engaged the Patriot frontiersmen and militia. Whichever faction controlled the Ohio River would have access to the Mississippi River, a key water supply and transit route. Frontiersmen, like Daniel Boone, rose to prominence during the American Revolutionary War, fighting Native Americans that had allied themselves with Britain, primarily the Shawnee. Frontiersmen like Boone had violated the Proclamation Line of 1763, settling beyond the Appalachian Mountains, and they were determined to defend their illicit settlements in Indian country. The fighting on the frontier was fierce, even more so than in the South. An early engagement, the Battle of Wyoming, fought on July 3rd, 1778, saw a Loyalist militia of about 100 men, with over 400 Seneca allies, attack and defeat a Patriot force of about 360. 340 of the Patriots were killed, with the Seneca collecting over 200 scalps. Patriot eyewitnesses claim that the Seneca captured and tortured some of the Patriot prisoners to death, 
a common ritual amongst the Eastern Woodlands peoples, as discussed in a previous video. The eyewitnesses also claimed, more dubiously, that the Seneca had killed non-combatants, including women and children. The British commander at Wyoming, John Butler, denied the attacks amongst, against the civilians, although he confirmed that the Seneca showed no mercy to the militiamen, killing every soldier they came across. Butler said that the Seneca left took only five militiamen alive, although he never stated what happened to these prisoners. Events in New York also encouraged the Patriots to take a harder stance against Native Americans that were allied with the British. The killing of Jane McRae in 1777 during the Saratoga Campaign and the Cherry Valley Massacre of November 11th, 1778, in which Indians and Loyalists attacked a Patriot community in New York, caused this change in increased aggression against Native Americans. At Cherry Valley, the Seneca actually killed Patriot civilians. In response to these attacks, as well as the death of Jane McRae, the Patriots made reprisals on British ally Native American settlements, burning villages to the ground in Pennsylvania. The destruction of the militiamen in Wyoming and the killing of civilians in New York inspired General George Washington to order a punitive attack on British allied Iroquois territory in upstate New York in the summer of 1779. Washington ordered the expedition's commander, Colonel John Sullivan, to destroy all British allied Iroquois power by any means necessary and to clear the area of all hostile Native Americans. Although Sullivan and his men quickly focused on removing all Native Americans, regardless of their allegiance. Sullivan's expedition saw intense violence against British allied Native Americans in upstate New York. And as I said, other Native Americans became caught up in his attacks as well. Sullivan's army destroyed about 40 Iroquois villages, forcing the survivors to flee northward to Canada. There were also reports of violence by continental and militia soldiers against Iroquois non-combatants and of soldiers mutilating the bodies of Indians they had killed. Sullivan's march was a resounding tactical success for the Continental Army. It neutralized the power of the British allied Iroquois nations and opened upstate New York for increased white settlement. The campaign also earned Washington the nickname Town Destroyer from aggrieved Indians. Sullivan's march forced thousands of Iroquois from their ancestral homelands, with countless more dying from disease, exposure, and starvation as a result of losing their homes. Some scholars classify Sullivan's march as an act of ethnic cleansing in which one group forcibly removes another from its homeland. Some even refer to Sullivan's march as an act of genocide. No matter the terminology that is used, Sullivan's march with its ferocity did have historical precedent. The colonial militias and their wars against Native Americans had targeted for destruction Native American villages and saw this punitive strategy as essential to their tactics as a destruction of villages would compel Indian foes to cease fighting and give up their land due to a loss of their winter supplies. The Patriots used this strategy during the Revolutionary War, learning from the wars in colonial America and the US military would use this same approach in later conflicts. Further to the West, the fighting between Patriots, the British, and Native Americans was also severe and acrimonious. Each faction targeted the other's settlements 
and the British, in particular, offered compensation to Native Americans who would attack Patriot settlements. All the while, additional white settlers, mostly Patriots from Virginia, moved westward along the Ohio River Valley into Kentucky and the Ohio country, settling on land left behind by both Native Americans and frontiersmen. In the Ohio country, a multinational task force, including Patriot soldiers, French Canadian militia, and some Native Americans, led by George Rogers Clark, defeated the British Army and its own Native American and Loyalist allies, bringing the contested region under Patriot control in July of 1778, after the capture of British Fort Vincennes. Early in the war, French Canadiens had been reticent to support the Patriot cause, but France's entrance into the war on the American side convinced many to side with the independence-minded colonists against the British. The Americans and their allies would fail to capture Detroit, then a major British fort, but the British also failed to recapture the Ohio country and what will become the state of Kentucky. The violence of the war in the Ohio River Valley led participants to call the region, especially Kentucky, the dark and bloody ground. With the Ohio River in American hands, the Patriots could now haul supplies up the Mississippi and Ohio rivers to Pittsburgh from New Orleans, skirting the British blockade of their Atlantic ports. This became even easier after Spain entered the war in favor of the Patriots in 1779. The Spanish sold the Patriots discounted supplies, allowing them to skirt the British naval blockade. The Spanish governor of Louisiana, Bernardo Galvez, also attacked British forces in West Florida as well, capturing the city of Pensacola. The Patriots' tactical successes in the West allowed the Patriots to secure the frontier from British attacks. At the same time, the fighting in the region greatly weakened Native American power as the tribes lost valuable land, resources, and people in the fighting, all while additional white settlers poured over the Appalachian Mountains and into the territory. At the same time, another European power, the Netherlands, entered the war in favor of the United States in 1780, following Spain. The Netherlands joined the conflict on the Patriot side after John Paul Jones, an American naval commander, sought refuge in a Dutch port. The Dutch had long traded with the American Patriot colonies, becoming very rich by selling the rebellious colonists gunpowder and weapons and other goods. But when the British demanded that the Dutch turn Jones over to their troops, the Dutch refused and entered the war on the Patriot side in 1780. Now that we've discussed all of the major theaters of operations in the American Revolutionary War, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, the South and the West, and we've discussed some of the countries that supported the Patriot cause, France, Spain, and the Netherlands, we will go back to Virginia, where the major fighting of the American Revolutionary War ended. As you remember, General Charles Cornwallis, failing to make ground in the Deep South, planned a bold assault on Virginia, where he hoped to separate General Greene's Southern Army from General Washington's Northern forces. Washington, with the advice of French commander Rochambeau, moved his army southward to confront Cornwallis in Virginia. The British High Command, under General Henry Clinton, mistook Washington's southward march for an assault on New York City and ordered Cornwallis to retreat to Yorktown on the Virginian coast, not far from the old Jamestown settlement. Yorktown was situated on a peninsula 
and thus Cornwallis's army was vulnerable, being surrounded by water on three sides. The French Navy encircled Cornwallis and prevented his resupply and reinforcement by water. At the same time, Washington and Rochambeau's troops blocked Cornwallis on land. For over a month, the British held out, sustaining artillery bombardments from the sea and land attacks from the joint Franco-American task force who encroached closer and closer to the British fortifications with each passing day. The British were finally forced to surrender on October 16, 1781, having lost over 300 KIA and 600 wounded out of their 10,000 man force. Had Cornwallis not surrendered, his troops probably would have faced death from disease, exposure, and starvation as their supplies dwindled and the winter set in in Virginia. Cornwallis's surrender, which effectively destroyed the British Army's southern wing, lowered the British morale both in the American colonies and across the Atlantic. The loss at Yorktown, though it did not officially end the war, motivated the British government to seek negotiations with the American colonies. The British and American governments began peace negotiations in early 1782. Both nations would ratify the Treaty of Paris, signed September 3, 1783, officially ending the American Revolutionary War. The Patriots, with their ragtag citizen militias and their small continental army, had survived war with Great Britain, the most powerful empire on earth, and in doing so, had earned their independence. The Treaty of Paris secured the 13 colonies' independence from Great Britain. The British also ceded control of Florida, returning it to the Spanish. British property in the American colonies was to be seized by the new United States, but the treaty recommended, quote unquote, that loyalists be allowed to keep their property or have items taken from them during the war be returned. The Treaty of Paris also mandated that both sides repatriate, return their prisoners of war, and that both Britain and the United States would have access to the Mississippi River. Most importantly, the new United States gained control of all land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River including the hotly contested Ohio country and what is now the states of Michigan and Wisconsin, as well as part of Minnesota. When drawing up this treaty, neither side gave its Native American allies a seat at the negotiation table. The U.S.'s gain of the Midwest, what was at the time called the Northwest, would lead to a series of wars between the new nation and the various Indian tribes that called the region home. In the end, the United States victory in the American Revolutionary War fundamentally altered and realigned the course of the Americas and indeed the world's history. The American colonists' victory over the mighty British Empire would help to inspire other independence movements in the Americas, including in Haiti in 1791 and several other Latin American nations from 1808 to 1833. The American Revolutionary War was also the beginning of the end of European colonialism in Americas, as this new conflict inspired other colonies to fight for their independence and become new nations. The American Revolution would also have profound effects across the Atlantic as well. 
the war would inspire the French Revolution of 1789, both ideologically and economically, as France's taxation of its people, in order to pay for their involvement in the Revolutionary War, would be a major grievance of the revolutionaries. The loss of the American colonies would also help to inspire political and social reforms within the British Empire, including Britain's banning of the slave trade in 1807 and eventual abolition of slavery in 1833. Within America, the ideals of the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence, the nation's founding document, helped to inspire social changes and reforms as well. In the northern states, the ideals of the revolution, combined with the courageous service of African-American patriots, helped to bring a gradual end to slavery. Massachusetts and Pennsylvania abolished slavery in 1780 before the war had even ended. In Massachusetts, freedom for African Americans was confirmed by the case of Elizabeth Freeman, who sued for her freedom in 1781, arguing that American revolutionary ideals were inconsistent with slavery. Other states, like Connecticut, ended the institution in 1784. The new state of New Hampshire which joined the Patriot Colonies in 1776, abolished slavery in 1783. Vermont, which joined the United States in 1790, forbade slavery from the beginning. Other northern states, like New York, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, were slower to abolish slavery. New York passed a gradual emancipation law in 1799, which was not completed until 1827. Rhode Island, which initially forbade American slavery as a colony in 1652, did not ban human bondage again as a state until 1843. New Jersey officially ended slavery in 1846, but some enslaved people remained until 1865 and the end of the U.S. Civil War. In the South, the liberating ideals of the American Revolution threatened the institution of slavery. At the same time, however, white Southerners used revolutionary values to justify their enslavement of other human beings, particularly by claiming that the Declaration of Independence guaranteed their right to property, even human property. Some Southern colonies, like Virginia, explored the possibility of abolishing slavery as early as 1800, but these emancipation laws never passed. Slavery had made white Southern plantation owners quite wealthy, and although many of them recognized that the institution was morally wrong, they were more afraid of what would happen if they freed their enslaved people than if they kept them in chains, highlighting the white supremacist ideals of many elite white Southerners, who feared living in a society where black people would be equal to poor whites. As seen during Bacon's Rebellion, which we discussed in a previous video. Emblematic of this trend, Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, third president of the United States and slave owner, famously said that keeping black people enslaved was like, quote unquote, holding a wolf by the ear. Over time, as slavery died out in the northern states, it would become even more powerful in the south but we'll discuss this development in future videos. Before we conclude our discussion of the American Revolutionary War, I want to help outline the critical part that women played in the revolution, particularly on the Patriot side. Although the American Revolution failed to extend equal rights to women, American women had nonetheless provided a central support to the Patriot cause what many at the time called Republican motherhood. Before the fighting had even started, 
Women had played an integral role in the boycott of British goods. Women found domestic substitutes for British goods. Instead of British tea, patriot-minded women made tea from sassafras, likely using techniques they had learned from Native Americans. You can see sassafras root here in this slide. They also wove their own American-made cloth called Lindsay Woolsey, a rough but durable hybrid textile of cotton and wool. Women also organized charities and raised money to help patriot organizations and militias. Women even protested, quote unquote, out of doors as well, demonstrating against business owners that sold British goods or that unfairly price gouged their customers. When the fighting of the Revolutionary War began, colonial American women continued to serve the Patriot cause. Seamstresses sewed uniforms for the militiamen and the Continental Army, and Betsy Ross, a New Jerseyan upholsterer, sewed the first official Stars and Stripes, from which the modern American flag is based, with the inclusion of additional white stars to represent new states added to the Union. The red and white stripes represented the 13 states, although some later flags would add additional stripes for new states. Nowadays, the official American banner has 13 stripes only to represent the original 13 colonies that became the states that declared independence from Great Britain. Women also served the Patriot cause in more direct ways as well. Women took care of colonial farms, homesteads, and businesses, while their men served in the militias or the Continental Army. Some women even traveled with the Patriot forces, serving as camp followers. These civilian women, as camp followers, performed critical logistical duties which, in modern wars, are generally completed by military personnel. These women forged food and supplies, prepared meals, nursed the sick and wounded, and washed and repaired uniforms. Some women even served as sex workers, although officers tried to ban camp followers from offering this illicit service, which was considered to be immoral. Women also served as camp followers for the British and Loyalist forces as well. On the frontier, Native American women continued to serve their families and communities in much the same way they had for centuries regardless of which faction their tribe supported, and African-American women, both enslaved and free, supported their families as well. Some women even served in combat. While neither the British regulars nor the Continental Army or the militias allow women to become soldiers in an official capacity, some women did serve in combat roles in an unofficial manner. Ann Bailey, a frontiers woman from Western Virginia, rejected colonial gender roles and joined a militia after her husband was killed by the Shawnee Indians in 1774. Bailey continued her militia service throughout the Revolutionary War, where she operated as a scout and courier for the Patriots. It's worth noting that Ann Bailey was born in Britain, and her deceased husband was actually a British soldier. So for Bailey, her service in the American Patriot Militia was probably more about revenge on the Shawnee than it was about Patriot ideals. For her actions against them, the, Shawn the Shawnee gave her the nickname Mad Anne. The, the most famous woman to fight in the American Revolution was undoubtedly the legendary Molly Pitcher. Molly Pitcher was a mythic figure. And there were several American women who inspired this archetype. Scholars generally think that Mary Ludwig Hayes, a German-American colonist, was the original Molly Pitcher. Hayes was a camp follower, and, a, and her husband was a cannoneer in the Continental Army. During the Battle of Monmouth, fought in New Jersey on June 28, 1778, Mary Hayes was carrying water to the artillerymen, who used the water to keep their cannon barrels from overheating. Mary's husband fell in the battle, and she took his place, 
working on one of the artillery pieces. For her brave service, she received a commendation from General Washington, as attested in accounts written by veterans of the battle. Others suggest that Molly Pitcher was actually Margaret Corbin, whose artillerist husband also fell in battle in 1776, leading her to serve on his gun, just like Mary Hayes. Still others suggest the real Molly Pitcher was a woman named Deborah Sampson, who disguised herself as a man and fought for the Continental Army. Sampson and Corbin eventually received veterans pensions for their service, but Hayes did not. In the end, women played a critical role in the American Revolutionary War, both in its beginnings and throughout the conflict, just as African Americans and indigenous people did as well. Over the course of eight years of fighting, between 25 and 70,000 people died in the American Revolutionary War out of a population of about 2.5 million colonists. About one to 3% of the population died due to the war. In addition, 22,000 British soldiers and loyalists died as well. The violence of the American Revolutionary War gained the 13 colonies, the new 13 United States, independence from Great Britain. Their struggle created a new nation, the United States of America, the first independent Euro-American country. The ideals of the Revolutionary War, best seen in the 1776 Declaration of Independence, would inspire other wars of independence and revolutions across the world. The ideals of the Revolutionary War would also inspire the abolition of slavery in the Northern United States and Great Britain. Although slavery persisted in the South after the war ended and even increased. Native Americans and African Americans took part in the war, fighting for both sides, but they were both left out of the negotiations. The rejection of Native American concerns at the Treaty of Paris would lead to future conflicts between the new United States and the indigenous peoples of the North American continent. Like African Americans and Native Americans, women played a major role in the Revolutionary War, especially on the logistical side, even though very few served in combat positions because of the gender norms of the day. All in all, the American Revolution was a significant event in world history, creating the world we know today. It also created the United States of America. We will discuss how the American nation changed over time in future videos.